So by defining these positive definite uh, <clears throat> uh, weighting matrices that define sort of the relative importance of sending our state or components of our state to zero versus how much energy we exert between different components of our control, uh, we can seek to uh, specify a controller that is, at least in this sense, optimal. Okay, so, so let's have a go at doing that. Um, and again, I, I won't go into the details too much about how this is computed. It turns out you went for a linear system, you end up with an algebraic Riccati equation, which uh, is relatively easy for a computer to solve at least, and, and which again, in MATLAB or Python, there are inbuilt packages that do all this under the hood for you. <clears throat> um, and the nice thing about this form of control where we, is that as well as being optimal, uh, we also have in some sense a guarantee of robustness, uh, which, I, which comes in the form of guaranteed stability margins, which I'm, I'm not going to go into too much in this lecture, but uh, <clears throat> it's sort of a nice added bonus for LQR control with full state feedback. So once again, let's implement this in practice. So again, the, the choices that I have now are my R and Q matrices. So again, Q specifies how much I want to penalize um, not being at the state that I want to be at. And R penalizes uh, the effort that my controller has to exert. So let's try th three different examples of R. R is a scalar here because, my in because I only have a single input to my system. And we'll just take Q to be the identity. And really what matters here is the, the ratio between the sizes of Q and R. OK, so again, my controller is given by this K LQR. And actually, if I wanted to look at um, uh, I'll say LQR uh, uh, equals 100. I just realized it might be useful to actually see what the controller is outputting. R equals 1. R equals 0 0.1. This should be KLQR1, LQR2, and LQR3. So I can run this. I get my three different controller gains. Um, and then these, these actually make sense if you think about it. So when R is really big, I'm penalizing the effort that my controller has to exert a lot more. And so I end up with relatively low controller gains. Conversely, when my R is small, I allow my controller to have a lot more freedom to, to use up a lot of energy, and so I get comparatively larger gains. Then what I can also look at is how these controllers move my eigenvalues. So the, the black crosses here are the open loop poles of my system, of the un uncontrolled case. For R equals 100, that's where I have very small controller gains. We stabilize the system, which we're guaranteed to do, but we don't move the eigenvalues very much at all. So this is kind of like the, the low effort controller, the, the, sort of the student that just wants to pass and does minimal effort in order to, to get the, uh, the one outcome that they need to do, which is to stabilize the system. Whereas if we allow our controller to be more aggressive, then we move the eigenvalues further into the left half plane. Uh, and presumably drive our system to the desired state more quickly, which we can test. So what I can do is generate my closed loop systems with uh, my various LQR controllers with different levels of aggressiveness, shall we say, and then do our same trick before where we'll run our system, and then at a certain time, turn on our closed loop control 
uh, and see how our controllers perform. And this is the response that we get. So we see, again, as, as, we, as we expect, all of our controllers stabilize our system. Um, but the one which only shifted the eigenvalues a little bit still sort of has this ringing at about the same frequency as our unstable system. <clears throat> Whereas the more aggressive controllers drive our uh, response to zero more quickly. Now, which one is better? Again, probably depends on how much uh, authority your, co your controller might have in practice <clears throat> or how much energy you want to exert uh, driving your system to whatever you want it to go to. <clears throat> okay. And actually, uh, no, I won't do that. So what this means <clears throat> so, so we've, we've kind of introduced a range of uh, ways in which you can design controllers to stabilize linear systems. For all of them, there are some parameters that you need to define. Uh, so in some cases, you directly define parameters that are in, that define the dynamics of your controller. <clears throat> uh, so that was the proportional or PID control. Uh, you can directly define what you want the eigenvalues of your closed loop system to be if you, if you have full state feedback. And so that was pole placement where we used the place command. Or we can define uh, uh, an, an optimal controller uh, where we need to specify these Q and R matrices. So depending on what is the more convenient user input or how much you know about your system, there, there are numerous tools available here. So there are many, many more methods that we could talk about, uh, which I'll, I'll mention briefly, but not, not do any examples of. So one, one thing that I'm not going to have time to talk about is uh, looking at other ways to analyze linear systems. So we looked at the root locus plot, which is one of several tools that, we can, that can be used to understand dynamics, predict stability, and, and design controllers. So you can also look at Bode plots, at Nyquist plots, and then define uh, <clears throat> metrics rel related to how close to being unstable your, uh, say, closed-loop system is. Another thing that I haven't talked about, but that we can also do, is we can still utilize some of these uh, full state feedback uh, methodologies, even if we don't directly know the full state by using an estimator, so such as using a Kalman filter, uh, which I mean, we can use the estimated state as a proxy for the true state in order to apply full state feedback methods. Um, so for example, one can do LQG control, or linear quadratic Gaussian control, which combines a Kalman filter with an LQR controller. Um, and the nice thing about this is that if you design both of them separately to be stable, then your combined system will be stable. Though there are some issues in, in terms of not getting the same robustness properties that you get for, say, a full, uh, <clears throat> a full state LQR controller. I will mention that these things are, are easy to do in MATLAB. In Python, it's a little bit trickier. So the Python control systems toolbox at some point has or doesn't have full functionality in the sense that you can't just type in LQG. You kind of have to build things up by hand a little bit, but it's, it's still relatively or not, not too tricky to, to implement these sorts of things. And then I haven't really talked about several other methods that we can, that we can look at that uh, either still are in the realm of linear control. So we can also look at uh, robust control, modern control methods that are designed to give you, say, a specified closed loop, specified closed loop dynamics while also ensuring that your system is going to be robust to disturbances or uncertainties, which could include nonlinear effects, for example. And then there are other variants which can be particularly useful if, say, you have a nonlinear system that uh, 
doesn't have one sort of global linearization that's always going to work. So for example, you can look at uh, finite time horizon model predictive control, which has a similar setup to, to some of the, uh, these other methods, particularly LQR, but uh, again, can be uh, beneficial to use in, in applications where you don't have a perfect uh, linear system that's going to remain the same linear system uh, for asymptotically long times. Um, the point that I wanted to make, or one additional point that I wanted to make, is that even though a lot of these tools are simple, and a lot of you probably have uh, come across them before in, a, in an undergraduate or a graduate controls course, that a lot of these tools can actually be implemented in practice. Uh, I'll talk, a, I'll talk a little bit more about where they can't. But for example, uh, if you look at canonical fluid flows, uh, then there are several examples in almost every canonical fluid flow where you could see the success, sort of successful implementation of linear control methods uh, to control a, a nonlinear system. So for example, we can look at controlling or, or delaying the transition to turbulence in a boundary layer. And, Really, I'm trying, what I'm trying to show here is basically the same plots that I was looking at for my simple system, but applied to uh, a more complicated or real flow. So here we have, this is from uh, Belson et al. We're looking at uh, controlling a transition in a boundary layer, and we find that with control, we're able to um, drive our system closer to zero. And this is with um, just simple PI feedback. So nothing more complicated than uh, a proportional gain plus an integral gain. Of course, you have choices regarding where you put your sensors and actuators, which again is, is sort of beyond uh, the scope of the example that I looked at. But um, by modeling the system in the right way, you can, you can actually utilize some of these tools in practice. Uh, so one can also look at... Uh, Flows over, flow over cavities. Um, so this was some work by Baba Gallo et al., I think including Peter Schmidt and Danny Sipp, where, again, you have an uncontrolled system, which is this red line. When you turn on your feedback controller, <coughs> uh, you, you, re, you kind of can control this, this instability. And I believe this was using LQG control. So again, something similar to the, to the optimal control that we talked about. Uh, one can also look at control of bluff bodies. So uh, again, there's several works on this, this uh, of which I'm, these are only some. And this is a plot from, from Illingworth where, uh, where you, for control, I think we use blowing and suction on the cylinder and we're measuring, and the, the authors are measuring at certain locations in the wake and managing to stabilize uh, flow over a cylinder at a Reynolds number of 100. Um, <clears throat> and again, I think this is using H-infinity control, so uh, it's one of those robust loop-shaping variants, but still just using uh, linear modeling and control methodologies. Uh, and then lastly, if we look at uh, a highly nonlinear system, so wall-bounded turbulence, then again, relatively simple linear control modulo certain technicalities can be shown to uh, effectively manipulate your system. So this is uh, classic opposition control. So we sense somewhere in the flow and then actuate uh, sort of in the opposite direction. So really this is just proportional control with k equals one most simply. Uh, and it was show, I guess first explored in the 90s by Choi et al. And you can show you can actually reduce uh, the required pressure gradient to drive your system uh, using these, these simple feedback control laws, which here is really uh, sort of manipulating the dynamics close to your boundary. Now, of course, there are, there are a lot of caveats with, uh, with when, when linear control works. Um, <clears throat> so you, you need to have control authority. You need to have a good model for your system. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and so forth. But the point that I wanted to make is that, at least as a starting point, 
it, it can actually be used in practice. And over the last several decades, uh, it has been successfully used in, in a range of applications. Um, so the last example that I, that I wanted to show was uh, an example that I did actually with, with Steve and, and Clancy early in my PhD, where we are controlling uh, the lift on this airfoil, where now our desired uh, lift is um, some arbitrarily varying function, and so we have a we design a control strat a feedback controller that that sort of tells our airfoil how to move in order to obtain this desired lift coefficient. Um, so again, it's, it's it's a relatively simple system because it's a low Reynolds number, and we're actually measuring the thing directly measuring the thing that we're trying to control. But again, it's a highly nonlinear system because we're going over. Uh, quite a large range of angles of attack, but linear control works. <clears throat> so, and that, that basically wraps up the, the material that I have. Uh, so I'm happy to take any other questions or comments uh, at this point. Thank you very much, Professor Dolan, for this excellent review. Um, questions? Okay, maybe I have one very uh, quick. Um, when you use this kind of methods and you base yourself on a system identification step, let's say, to get your, your system, um, what would be your advice concerning the tuning of these parameters, such as your, uh, your uh, LQR, so your Q and your R, uh, when it comes to the sensitivity of your identification step? So let's say that your identified system is not exactly the good one. Uh, what can go wrong if... Uh, you decide uh, to actuate with an LQR? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, so LQR, sort of as I mentioned, ha you know, does have some guaranteed uh, stability margin, so that's good. But uh, you, you know, I, I imagine that, for example, if your controller is too aggressive, then uh, maybe you can excite dynamics that are not modeled in, your, in, in, your, uh, in, in the model that you've gotten for your system. And that, where that could happen is if, in doing feedback, your, so if, you, if, let's say, you identify a model using an uncontrolled system, now all of a sudden you're, you're applying some control to it, you're going to be exciting dynamics that are not modeled at all. And so that could be a problem, which I kind of skirted around here by, well, obviously using a simple example where I'm assuming that I'm restricted to this two-dimensional subspace, uh, which, which doesn't happen in practice. So I guess possibly what you would want to do is, in the system identification step, use data where you're actually actuating your system in some way. And that would might not be guaranteed to work, but at least you want to do your system identification on data which is representative of what you're going to get when you, when you implement your control. Now, there might be other issues as well in terms of, uh, you know, how, at, at what point you want to uh, sort of truncate your system, uh, but that, that's perhaps one aspect that is a complication that needs to be considered. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, then may I have another one then. Um, when you do your linearization, you decide uh, over a, a certain interval of time within which you are yeah. going to build your system and then act. Uh, in case your, your problem is non-linear, maybe you, one obvious solution say, might be to try to reduce your, uh, your time, to try to you know, linearize it uh, in, in, in smaller step. Uh, and how helpful could that be if you, if you try to make like, piecewise linearization all the time? Yeah, so one, one could do something like that. And then that, I guess when you're designing a controller, that's where something like model predictive control can help, where you're... Uh, you're trying to optimize just over a finite time horizon. So if you at least know what the, if you know some linearized dynamics that are relatively accurate, at least locally within the region of state space that you're, that you're in, then probably you have a better hope for that sort of more ch tuned control strategy to that particular region of space that you're in working. Um, so I, I, I guess that's one, one comment that I would have there. Um, Thank you. Other questions? Well, it seems it was really clear then. 
Um, I think then we can go for uh, for lunch and we come back uh, as as planned. I would say. So we have a slightly shorter uh, lunch break. What do you think? Is it okay? I take it as a yes. Thanks again to Professor Dozen.